Uh, good afternoon, and uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk to all of you. Um, I know that you've already had a long day, and it's very hot, but we'll try to deal with a topic that hopefully is a little bit uh, interesting and exciting, and uh, I'm sure you may have a lot of uh, questions that hopefully I can answer for you. Uh, the topic that uh, I'm going to be discussing with you today is uh, EU uh, both uh, private and public responses to the financial crisis. And as we all know, this is not only a um, financial crisis, but it's an ongoing crisis in which we seem to be lurching from drama to drama almost on a daily basis. And as you also know, uh, France is, of course, a very major player, for good or for bad. And just in the last three days, we have had the uh, recurrence of the French-Belgium bank Dexia, which seems to be throwing everything one more time into turmoil, but also which may be perhaps a flashpoint to bring about perhaps some more radical and immediate changes and reforms. What I would like to do is to look at a variety of responses. And I want to start with the political responses, then look at more of some of the uh, technical economic responses, and then what I call the impact and, uh, in a sense, uh, cross-correlation of economic and culture, economic cultural responses. When we talk about political responses to a crisis between Europe and the United States, I think we immediately have to think about the perceptions and misperceptions of the role of government. And this is a very, very important issue because the idea of governments intervening, taking control, and in a sense taking over major private institutions in times of crisis is something which is fundamentally acceptable in the European historical psyche. It is something which is fundamentally unacceptable and shocking in the United States. And I just want very quickly to revert to the start of this whole mess. And remember, this is literally exactly three years ago, a month ago, September 15, 2008. Lehman fails after last minute desperate attempts to find what we called a white knight, which was actually supposed to be the Barclays Bank in London. And we immediately have global repercussions. The Dow drops 900 points. <clears throat> we have a sensation of total panic across the American economic landscape, as within literally two weeks, we see not only Lehman, we see AIG, one of the world's largest insurance company that needs a bridge loan to even survive. We have Freddie, May, <coughs> Freddie and Fannie, in other words, the two largest mortgage-backed institutions in the United States, which interestingly enough, unknown to most of the American public, had actually been privatized about 20 years before and suddenly had to be renationalized. We not only have Lehman that basically collapses, we also have the Vacovia Bank, we have Merrill, we have a whole series of crisis upon crisis in enormous rapidity and very deeply ensconced at the very foundations of the American economic system. What is the response in Europe? <clears throat> you may remember that between September and December 2008, despite the collapse of Iceland, despite the fear of imminent collapse of UK banks, overall the European response, interestingly enough, is clarity, speed, and coordination. Uh, Americans are astonished. And, and you know, the, uh, the saying that, and, and I'm sure you know this, of course, uh, in France and in the United States, that this was one of the absolute first times in history that France decided to put practice before theory. Right? <laughs> Actually, it happened. Actually, it okay. um, And this was very important because this immediately gave a sense that all of the EU governments were going to undertake in sync a number of the following steps. They all immediately increased insurance deposit, uh, deposit insurance for banks across the board, which had occurred in the United States from 100,000 to 250,000. Considering that all bank regimes across Europe still functioned on national lines, 
and that at that time, the concept of a financial plan to harmonize the European financial and banking industry was still a work in progress and had been a work in progress since 1994. Yet despite all of that, the banks and the governments work to do the following. So you have the increase in deposit insurance, you have, if and when necessary, either nationalization or as in the UK, so-called partial nationalization of the largest banks, of Barclays, of Lloyds, of HBO. You also have, what is even more important, imposed capital injections. And what that meant was that all major banks around Europe were basically told by their governments, you will accept large recapitalization and capital injections, whether you like it or not. And it was quite fascinating from a cultural perspective, the responses. Uh, the initial response from the BNP was, you know, I think we can take care of ourselves. The initial response from Deutsche Bank was even more striking in which Ackermann, the CEO of Deutsche, said, we will certainly not accept government money. That would be shameful. Despite all of that, it was going to happen. But if the governments, the banks, and the EU structures worked in sync and immediately stabilized the system and gave out the message to the markets that European banks were fine, there was an interesting flip side on perception. What was the response to this crisis in Europe? Who was to blame? America. Who was immediately to blame? Cowboy capitalism. And you know, the phrase cowboy capitalism is rather charming because it was originally coined by Expansion in 1983, in which they came out with that. And it, of course, was at the heart of the response to the 1987 financial crash on Wall Street, where the European press, led by the French press, immediately accused Americans of this sort of Wild West capitalism. And the idea was, and I just want to read to you uh, a couple of, of just quotes. Uh, <clears throat> between the end of 2008, late fall, and beginning of 2009, Remember that in the United States, not only did the government have to right away intervene and take control, and just the technical term of the processes under which it took control was called TARP. And TARP stands for Troubled Asset Relief Program. The TARP went along with even a more technical uh, mechanism, which was called TALF, which was Term Asset-Backed Securities Loan Facility which basically meant that the government was going to take control and responsibility for the liabilities of every one of these banks as things got worse or were they to get worse, and was going to pour in an enormous amount of money into the financial system. Now, the next step to this was finding out that the damage and the exposure of US banks was even far deeper. The same sort of thing we're now going through with the EU banks, but in 2008, it was US banks. <laughs> the exposure was far deeper, and therefore, the risks were even greater. What that meant was that in February of 2009, end of January, February 2009, the US government had to come in and actually take a 36% share of Citicorp, right? Citigroup. So you have here this huge, global, American institution, which is literally the symbol of American capitalism run amok around the world, and all of a sudden you have the government coming in and having basically to nationalize, partial nationalization, nothing terribly dramatic from European perspective, it's only 36%. But what are some of the responses? And it's rather interesting. <laughs> First of all, we see economic and political discourse which tended to use and to misuse all forms of terminology. Whether you were talking about nationalization, capitalism, socialism, depression, everything became fraught with an enormous amount of political and emotional context. In February 2009, February 16, 2009, the cover of Newsweek, which is a prominent American uh, publication, heralded the following. This is on the cover. I quote, we are all socialists now, the perils and promise of a new era of big government. And a firestorm broke out in American politics, particularly among the disgruntled conservative faction of the Republican Party, where the same day as the Citigroup announcement, 
Rush Limbaugh, the most popular conservative radio show host in America, said the following, I quote, we cringe to watch capitalism insult it. So, all drama has broken loose. Just one last vacation, there was a cartoon that appeared in the Boston Globe at that time showing Chairman Bernanke and two of the other governors of the uh, Federal Reserve sitting around a table and they're saying the following, nationalization sounds too socialist, too Swedish. Suppose we call it something more all-American. Looking happy, they announce, we declare the patriotization of the banks. <laughs> they stand up, Bernanke waving a little flag, pledging allegiance and say, Operation Enduring Finance. <laughs> so why is this important? Because this gives you a sense of how deeply this went into not only the American political discourse, but also hit American popular culture. How profoundly there was this total sense of confusion and in a way of betrayal and a sense of what has suddenly happened to the system which is so profoundly part of American financial mythology. Now, the reality is that on both sides of the Atlantic, for a decade, and we really have to understand sometimes the historical concept and the context of these perceptions. Because let's remember that since 1999 to 2008, on both sides of the Atlantic, there was the general sense that the American system had been deemed infallible. You would only keep on merging, banks would keep on getting bigger, property prices would keep on expanding, opportunities would keep on booming. It was only way to go was up. In 2007, there was an article in the New York Times called The Second Gilded Age. And Sandy Vile, who at that time was no longer but had been the CEO of Citigroup, said the following, I quote, the whole world is moving to the American model of free enterprise and capital markets. Can't go wrong. Now, what happened in the ensuing year, bringing us to where we are? There began to be a sentiment, both in the United States and in Europe, that overall, despite the enormous shock and impact of what had happened with Lehman and American banks, that there was, after all, light at the end of the tunnel. We were beginning to see mild, but still slowly steady recovery of the economies, or if not recovery, certainly stabilization. <coughs> there was the sense that Europe had come out of this fairly unscathed. I mean, I can tell you myself from the courses I teach, from all the lectures I give, in 2000, end of 2009, beginning of 2010, there really was sort of the sense that you know, Europe seems to be fine, European banks, certainly BNP, Santander, HSBC, Deutsche, Really, they're okay. So now let's move on and let's see how we can start some sort of more coordinated regulatory reform to presumably guarantee this doesn't happen again. I mean, this seemed to be the overall momentum. In March 2010, when the Greek crisis breaks out, the initial response is fairly muted. The initial idea in the financial press and academia and the markets, there's, there's great interest in this, there's no question. And there's a little bit of confusion because the confusion largely is, why is this actually such a big problem? What is this exactly? And I can tell you, I was gone as how many times on Bloomberg and elsewhere and being asked, well, you know, what does that mean? You know, what is, and the initial response was, look, this is a problem. But in reality, Greece is only 2.7% of the broader uh, EU GDP. And this is, in other words, the same thing as if we had a major crisis in Connecticut. Right? So this is not something that is that dramatic. Presumably, it's containable. The thing that was beginning to be a little bit disturbing was that it appeared that the Europeans themselves were dragging out how to resolve this problem. 
The other thing that began to trickle into market perception was that maybe we were not getting all the information. And again, because particularly in the United States, and I'm going to talk about this in a few minutes, there is very, very little historical memory. In fact, there is very severe historical amnesia. In fact, historical amnesia usually seems to go roughly anything that happened three months ago. So what that meant was very, very few people, even in the educated financial media and press, understood a couple of things. One, what was really the difference between Eurozone and non-Eurozone countries? What was the overarching historical and economic framework of the European Union and the basis of European monetary unification? The other issue was Greece itself. Everyone had forgotten, and I'm afraid on both sides of the Atlantic, that in 1999, Greece did not come into the Eurozone because everyone knew they weren't ready. So when did Greece actually come in? In 2001. Because politically, it made sense. And politically, in relation with Turkey, in relation with the overall complex situation and interrelationships of politics and economics in Europe, it made sense. The Greeks fudged the numbers from day one. But the world was doing well, the economy was booming, let's move on. This was not understood, and yet there was beginning to be a sentiment of, I would say, ill ease. Finally, in May of 2010, when the first European <coughs> financial stabilization facilities were finally set out, there began to be a sense, OK, they have now this huge fund. They seem to be working much more closely in sync between the European Central Bank, the EU Commission, the IMF, and the national treasuries. And here I also want to mention an interesting aspect. <clears throat> we have to remember that uh, particularly economic information, as it's conveyed in global media, becomes very often diluted. It has to be simplified. It has to be presented in ways that are clear. So the people who actually represent their countries and represent institutions are enormously important to this kind of discourse. The huge advantages that Europe had was having, as French Minister of Finance, Christine Lagarde, having Dominique Strauss-Kahn, head of the IMF, Trichet as head of the European Central Bank, people who had global recognition and who fundamentally had a great deal of respect in the United States. You also had on the German side, with Schnabel, with Steinbrucker, you had people who, with Merkel, with Sarkozy, people with whom America was comfortable. So this was certainly a major issue in feeling they can get it together and they will move forward. <clears throat> and the issue of Christine Lagarde is particularly significant because we have to remember that for the United States, not only was Madame Lagarde entirely Anglophone, but profoundly, profoundly literate and knowledgeable of American corporate culture. She was the perfect, in a sense, translator to America of what Europe was doing. And, and I have to be very frank with you. Right now, you have a brand new uh, finance minister in France, Francois Bowen. No one really knows him. He's an he's a unknown. And I'm not saying he may not be just fine. But it's very different right now, at a time of crisis, to have an unknown. So these were issues which seemed to make people feel, OK. But as I said, the crisis was still seen a debt crisis. OK, that's fine. A debt crisis while the banks, and let's remember, were still claiming solvency. All of the European banks were saying, yes, of course, we have some exposure. Absolutely no real disclosure was coming out. And you all know why. Because French corporate history, it is deeply, deeply in scouts and institutional history in France that you have levels of secrecy, enormous levels of secrecy. The fundamental concept of so-called transparency, clarity, disclosure, accountability, terms that Americans love, whether they observe them or not, are barely given lip service in France. So, okay, 
The issue of French banks was essential because of the enormous presence of French banks also in the United States. The other issue was German banks. It appeared across the board that Deutsch and Commerce and Dresdner, having gone through the merger in 2007, were absolutely clean, not a problem. Where were their problems in Germany? In the Landesbanken, where the subsidies out of the EU had stopped by 2005. There, there were problems. But that was a local issue. That was not necessarily going to impact on US markets. It looked in Italy like Unicredito was still doing fine. Overall, and, it, and as you may remember, even as of a year ago, Berlusconi looked somewhat more credible than he does nowadays. Right? So it was still a little bit of a sense, maybe it's OK. And the UK, it was, there were major problems. But after partial or full nationalization of Royal Bank of Scotland, Barclays and Lloyds, it appears that these banks had again stabilized and were moving forward without major problems. So <coughs> these are issues that are Bar important Barclays to understand. Never took any, uh, cash. Excuse me? Barclays never took any government cash. Barclays wasn't part of that. Correct. That's right. No, I'm sorry. Barclays, the, there was that split in Barclays. And the split in Barclays was between Barclay Asset Management where there was the sense that they were doing OK. In fact, they actually were, had uh, uh, excellent results. And part of Barclays, which had to be taken under the wing of the British government. None of Barclays was taken so the, 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 government. the thing was, though, that again, whatever, whatever situation these banks were in, the idea was still this is a local problem. They seem to be doing, dealing with it. Governments seem to be, have it under control. We are not seeing any more dire effects hitting American banks, assuming. And the other assumption was that. This is a bank crisis. We have now moved into a debt crisis. And therefore, we have now moved into an issue where how are the credit agencies dealing with sovereign debt issues? How are other entities dealing with something that is no longer a financial crisis? This was, of course, the enormous mistake and the enormous lack of information out there. Because once it became clear that this was not a question of a separate debt banking financial crisis, but rather, what we came to learn, <coughs> excuse me, within basically the last six months, as more and more information started to pour out, and as it became clear that the fragility of these institutions was far deeper because of far, far greater exposure to actually Greece. Then what happened was. In the United States, a term was, coi was coined, which is a horrific term in my view, the PIGS. And what is the PIGS stand for? P-I-I-G-S. Portugal, Italy, Ireland, Greece, Spain. Okay? Now, it's a terrible term. And in my opinion, it's a very stupid term. Because in reality, every one of these countries is not identical to every other one of these countries. The reality is that in Ireland, there was a banking crisis. And therefore, the sense of how Ireland chose to resolve its particular problem is totally different than what would or would not be applicable to Portugal or to Greece. The situation in Portugal was dire, but interestingly enough, for other reasons, as like the situation in Spain. So there was no but. The perception began to be Wait a minute. And this was in the financial channels. This was in the financial press. You began to have the perception, you know what? Not only do they have Greece, look at this. They have this whole bunch. And remember that term pigs then carried all of the negative connotations. These big, lumbering, useless entities that seem to be feeding at the trowel of government subsidies and basically government funds. It was a misperception, but very easily began to feed into market fear. The issue also had to do with something more fundamental in the understanding of how Europe worked. The United States looked at the situation in Europe and said two things. Why can't they get their act together economically? Why can't they decide whether they're going to drop these weaker members just off the map? What is the problem? There was absolutely no 
debate and absolutely no understanding that fundamentally the European Union and the European Monetary Union from the very start was not an economic framework. It was a political framework. It was a political engine. It was political will. It was historical will that moved forward every single economic strategy from 1957 on. The this is an element that really did not come through in the perception in the United States. The other issues that began to create panic, and I'll talk about this in a moment, were the visuals and the semantics. The semantics, this issue of the so-called pigs and how it was interpreted. The visuals had to do with endless pictures of riots in Greece and endless pictures of riots literally moving everywhere and of course through the summer in London which created literally a panic in the US. But what was wrong with the visuals that Americans looked at at Greece? First of all we have to understand that the idea of immediate demonstrations by specific factions, usually union and left-wing factions, which is part of European political history, is not part of American political history, and has not been part of American political history for decades and decades. So this is number one. The other issue was, you were looking at these pictures of the Greeks rioting. Well, the interpretation, and I have heard this across the board, people would say, well, wait a minute. You have well-dressed, presumably well-fed, people in very nice sunglasses who seem to be walking around or sitting in cafes smoking and seem terribly upset about something or another, but it looks like a very nice sunny day. What exactly is their problem? This again may be superficial, it may be false, but it feeds into a sense of, okay, so you have entire countries in the European Union where presumably people retire at 55, where, and in fact it's true, in Greece, 27% of the Greek economy is the public sector, where in fact people have very lovely, generous pensions, and because Greece is a delightful, lovely country, they do sit in cafes, and they do have a drink, and they do smoke, and they do seem to enjoy themselves. Remember, we are still in the United States in a very, very complex dual structure. Yes, cowboy capitalism and also profound Calvinist puritanism on work ethic. So you can do anything you want and make a massive amount of money, but you work very hard and you're still highly regulated. And that is totally different than Europe. And again, there was the sense then why are we beginning to feel nervous? Why is there beginning to be a massive impact in the sense of instability in the banks, the structures, these governments at large? What is going on here? So huge amount of misunderstanding. The other thing that made the situation worse is we are now in the US in one of these endless 18-month electoral cycles. Uh, as you know, of course, in France, your election campaigns, and you certainly have one now coming up uh, in June, but it's still a roughly six weeks, month and a half long, two month long campaign. In the United States, because of money, because of the funding, because of the enormous complexities of the primaries, because of a number of other issues in this huge country with entirely different geopolitical and geoeconomic zones, Electoral campaigns and presidential campaigns can literally last 18 months. Why is this a problem? This is a major problem because in a lot of ways, the White House and Obama have paid very little attention to Europe to begin with and now have very little interest in what's going on there. So there is very little sense of a real direct contact and fostering of interest and awareness of what is Europe, what is the situation, what is happening. The other issue that's very complicated, and what I mentioned about semantics, the definition of liberalism, the definition of liberal economic policy, the definition of socialism, the definition of nationalization, of privatization, 
is in reality, and they may be exactly the same terms, right? Liberal, nationalization, privatization, exactly the same terms. And they have extremely difficult, different meanings, right? They do not fundamentally apply to the same concept of that integral relationship between the government and the private sector, between the role of responsibility, between the state and civil society. And this is another issue. The issue of basically Obama being detached from Europe does have repercussions because there is again sometimes the sense Europe is now being a problem. We don't want Europe to be a problem. This is a White House that is obsessed right now, and in many ways correctly so, with two wars, with China, with the economy. All of a sudden, you have Timothy Geithner who has to worry about Europe. Europe is supposed to be a safe, sound, stable ally. Occasionally, Europe is an extremely annoying ally, as the Americans found out in, during the Iraqi war from 2003 to 2006. And you may remember then the responses, the shock that suddenly Europe turned against the US so that you had some idiot congressman in Washington who suddenly said, we no longer have French fries and French toast. We have freedom fries and freedom toast. I, uh, we you know, are going to basically get rid of delightful and delicious French wine, and we will put horrific tariffs on foie gras and roquefort, and I guess we'll all feel better. But the reality was that still there was the sense on a profound level in a highly volatile and very uh, fragile global economic environment, Europe should not be a cause of concern. And all of a sudden, it is. And this is a problem. The other issue that also triggered panic in the markets, in the late spring, middle of May in 2011, as the crisis in Greece was getting worse, as exposure of the banks was getting greater, as it was clear that the IMF, the ECB, and the EU would have to work more in sync. And that was the Dominique Strauss-Kahn scandal. Let's forget about the personal issues. The issue, and I was interviewed constantly about it, the issue to me that was the most troubling was this was the last time, in, th this was the worst possible time to have a, more volatility in the basic institutions. It meant all of a sudden, Dominique Strauss-Kahn had to abdicate his position at the IMF. They had to go out and find someone new. Luckily, and very wisely, Madame Lagarde came in. And there was right away a sense, OK, someone is in charge. But this all played in. And it played into the idea, wait a minute, who is in charge in Europe? And let's remember another thing. This goes all the way back to the famous Kissinger phrase from 1973. You know, if I call Europe, who answers? Right? Who's in charge? The differences and, in a sense, of facilitation of the political process in the Lisbon Treaty has had no impact at all in the understanding of the EU and the United States. I mean, I don't know how many people in Europe know what it's actually done, but certainly not in the US. Right? So the fact in Europe, unfortunately, and I always thought this was a very big mistake, I have to tell you this, to have named a president, an EU president, and a so-called minister, of what, equivalent minister of foreign affairs. I'm sure that Mr. Rumpy and Madame Ashton are perfectly fine individuals, but they are unknown quantities. They do not present to the world a sense of individuals where people can say, aha, this is who we deal with. So again, it would fall back to, in fact, yes, to Trichet, to, in fact, Sarkozy, to Merkel, to basically the sense of, OK, are these people going to be able to take charge? And remember, this is confusing. Because in the United States, you say we have the White House. We then have the central bank, the Federal Reserve, and you have Treasury. So you're dealing with a secretary of the Treasury. There is no EU Treasury. You are dealing with the head of the central bank. Or, on the government level, you are dealing with the White House. Think about it in Europe. If you look at the financial press, if you look at all of the headlines, there are times when we're told Merkel and Sarkozy made a decision. There are times when we're told 
Trichet made a decision. There are times when we're told various ministers and national governments made a decision. It is confusing, and that adds in some ways. Now let me very quickly move on to some specific economic responses. We have been suffering in the last roughly six months by what I call market bipolarity. And what I mean by that is we literally have gotten to a point, and you all know this, where the market goes up 500 points, it goes down 300 points, it goes up 250 points, it goes down 500 points, and often for absolutely no good reason. Some of it has to do with hyperbolic and semi-hysterical press, and a lot has to do with 24-7 news and with 24-7 financial transactions. Remember today, markets function instantaneously. Markets often function on very highly computerized transactions. The speed, the absolute necessity to respond and react is so enormous in markets of such vast amounts of electronic money flowing through on a global scale, is that this, in a sense, influences these extremely bizarre and sharp ups and downs. And at the end of the day, this is troubling because if the market goes up 500 points because it looks like the Europeans are having a good day and agree on something, and the market goes down 300 points because it looks like Greece suddenly isn't happy, and the market goes up 450 points because suddenly Madame Merkel made it clear that the German parliament is, along, is moving along with her, and then the market completely flips and goes hysterical because it appears that the UK is nervous about the whole thing. So who do we trust? And this is a very, very important issue on both sides of the Atlantic. Who do we trust? Has there been a very profound intrinsic loss of confidence in the very anchors in the institutions, in the pillars. Same problem with the credit rating agencies. Right? I mean, this is another issue. This is both in Europe. What we are now discovering is that literally every one of the major banks in Europe has enormously more exposure to Greek debt, to Portuguese debt, to Italian debt, than perceived beforehand. We are also discovering that the numbers that Greece provided for the EU for literally 10 years were so 100% false that they don't even have any bearing to reality. We are also basically discovering that these same credit rating agencies <laughs> that now are downgrading, not only countries, remember all of Italy's been downgraded, the US was downgraded, but the major banks have been downgraded, VNP, Credit Agricole, right? Unicredito have been downgraded. So that's very nice. But then we go back a year ago and we say, well, wait a minute, how come in 2009 and 2010 the credit agencies thought all these banks were marvelous? They all had triple A rating. All these countries did. How come the stress tests in July 2010, 90 banks, only seven failed? You all know that the last stress tests in July 2011, Dexia had some of the best scores. So what does all this mean? And this is a very deeply troubling time. Now, I just want to remind you of something between the United States and Europe. Since 1992, there has been very strong Euroscepticism in the United States on the concept of European monetary unification. What is interesting is that from 1992 to 1999, top American economists, especially Martin Feldstein at Harvard, um, Rudy Dornbusch basically have declared, and he's still declaring, the whole thing's a disaster in waiting. On the other side of the coin, you had Robert Mondell here at Columbia, who in 1998, and I hope we're able to provide you with this article, March 24, 25, 1998 in the Wall Street Journal, Robert Mondell wrote a two-part article which gave the first official benediction to creating a European monetary union and the euro, which is quite fascinating and very important. But there have always been these two schools of thought. Today, Larry Summers, an article in the FT a few weeks ago, picking up some of the major points from Christine Lagarde and declaring basically a very important point that the fundamental strength of Europe and the Euro is that politicians will always desire to preserve it, 
while markets will always have the ability to bet against it. The, this dichotomy is there and it's deep. Now, today, if we have Larry Summers saying they're somehow going to have to fight and get it together, and I have to tell you from my own dealings with Larry Summers when I was in Washington, he always had a positive attitude. And I'll talk about that for one second. On the other side, you have Nouriel Roubini, right? you have George Soros, who keep on saying, for God's sakes, just ditch all these countries off and let's move on. So this is also ensconced in the American mindset. How do we look at these issues? And I have to tell you, I was in Washington with the Clinton administration. I was an advisor in finance policy because I'm French and I was dealing with uh, Europe. Um, and I wrote a, and started what's called a, a multi-agency initiative on Euro-dollar competitiveness. And there were three responses, and this was in the 1996 to 1998 period. One of them was, please, the Europeans will never get it together. Look what happened to them in the currency crisis of 92, 93. Won't happen. The second one was, you know, if it does happen, you can't create a currency overnight. This will absolutely not even be a problem. The dollar, total hegemony of the dollar. Number three, if and when it happens, we'll deal with it then. Right? Those were the three responses. Some of this is still fundamentally in place. Right? Now, why is some of this so hard at times to understand? Part of this has to do with perception of time and perception of history in political phenomena. Just September 30th, in the New York Times, it was a very good article, and I quote, in European crisis, little hope for a quick fix. Americans fundamentally want solutions. They want them quickly, and they want them efficiently. Europeans want resolutions. It's a very big difference. There is very little understanding, as I mentioned, of the complex interrelationship between politics and economics at the heart of the EU. There is also a profound lack of knowledge across the United States, in l'Amérique profonde, in the heartland of America of what in the world is the euro and what is the EU. That's why we can have headlines. Is the US becoming Greece? Are we all now becoming like the Greeks? Which makes no sense whatsoever. If you went across the United States and you talked to people about the euro, they would answer, oh yeah, that's really great. You know, Now tourism is so much easier. Whenever we go to different countries, we only need one currency. That's the extent of the knowledge. Right? There is very little discourse into the fundamental debates that are taking place in Europe. And there is also often not a complete understanding that even if Europeans don't like the United States, even if you want to criticize it, you still want in Europe a strong, sound US economy. There is an enormous amount of interest in Europe for the United States. In this country, particularly in times of elections, there is relatively very little interest of what happens abroad and what happens in Europe. As I said, you know, going back to after 9-11, Europe is a sound, stable ally. There was the shock of the response in Iraq, but Europe was mixed. Remember, some countries were for, some were against. But there was still the sense, you know what? Everything else that's going on, they still seem to be doing fine. They are not a problem. Right? This is very, very important. So the idea of benign neglect seems to be fine. I want to open it up now to questions, but we are right now at a time where we still need to sense that the US and Europe are safe havens in this economy. And I just want to mention one interesting criteria to you, despite all of the problems that have been going on. For the last 10 years, the ratio of reserves in dollar and euro in global central banks has literally not moved. Central banks across the globe still hold 65% of their reserves in dollar, roughly 30% in euro, and the other 5% in Swiss franc, Canadian dollar, Austrian, and sterling. So there is still very much, despite all that we hear about all these new markets and everything else, there is still the sense that somehow or another, these countries have to continue 
to function very much in sync, that Europe not only fundamentally, and I believe it will, has to now pick itself up and find a solution even at enormous cost, an enormous sacrifice. The United <coughs> States the same, but one way or another there has to be some steps forward to somewhat restabilizing the global environment. And I want to end here and I'm